morning ladies I am now going to pray us in quickly Heavenly Father your word is a lamp at our feet we thank you for your words that speak to our hearts and needs we long to soak in your teaching and learn more about you your life-giving messages are like rain showers on new green grass we need not just a sprinkle but a downpour a soaking abundant rain in our dry hearts even though life can be challenging, we proclaim the name of the Lord and praise the greatness of our God. God, I ask that you use me as your vessel as I lead this Bible study this morning. I pray that the ladies as well also just are able to absorb the word and allow it to meditate on their hearts and minds throughout the day. Amen. Quick prayer. <laughs> um, I'm just going to open this up on my computer now that I muted my computer. But we are diving into chapter 4 of Esther and I titled this one divine appointment simply because it's one of those chapters where um, Esther finally understands the purpose in her becoming the Queen of Persia I can get this to open up hopefully there's no problems today everything can just run smoothly but um, my highlighters that's what I was grabbing okay so you guys know the usual tools that I use are the Crayola Twistable Colored Pencils, the Sharpie Smear God Highlighters, I use the Crayola Super Tips Markers as well, and the Zebra Mild Liners. This is in the Cool Pack if I'm not mistaken. So I'll be using these tools today. If I can get this back in the way it should be. And then my Pentel pen, RSVP 0.7 millimeter pen. Hopefully this is zoomed in enough for you guys to see. Um, I'm trying a different setup with the camera. I have it on the right side of me instead of the left side because I normally put it on the left side. But, alright, everything is open now. Okay, let me just take my notes off from chapter 3 and move that to the side for the time being. And post-it notes, I forgot those. So I have my large 4x6, I think it is. The blue post-it note... Um, What other post-its do I want to use today? This coral. And I guess this flamingo. Those will be the three that I use today. And there is no specific order to how I use my post-its. I just grab whatever I think is cute. <laughs> Honestly, at the time. And let me charge my speaker because that had cut off in the middle. But, okay. Okay. I have my notes and everything for today. So we're going to start off, I guess, with, um, what are these, the first three verses down here at the bottom. So I'm going to read it through and then um, circle and underline as I need. So Esther agrees to help the Jews, chapter 4, verse 1. When Mordecai learned all that had been done, Mordecai tore his clothes and put on sackcloth and ashes and went out into the midst of the city and he cried out with a loud and bitter cry. Verse 2, he went up to the entrance of the king's gate for no one was allowed to enter the king's gate clothed in sackcloth. And in every province, wherever the king's command and his decree reached, there was a great mourning among the Jews with fasting and weeping and lamenting and many of them lay in sackcloth and sack cloth sorry and ashes so the words that I'm going to circle are sackcloth I'm going to also circle where is it morning and I believe lamenting 
So those are the three words that I have circled. Hopefully you guys can see this. And I already looked up the definitions for everything. So I'm actually going to use this flamingo post-it today. So um, for sackcloth, I'm going to write the definition here in this spot here. It's a coarse, loose cloth or sack. Coarse, loose cloth or sack used in mourning. And for bagging. So a sackcloth is a coarse loose cloth or sack used in mourning or for bagging. Mourning, um, I'm going to have to write this on the post-it note, but for lamenting, I'm going to write to mourn aloud to wail or to regret strongly so lamenting is to mourn aloud to wail to regret strongly And then for mourning, I have a few definitions written down. Um, I have the Hebrew definition as well as the English definition, so I'm going to write it on the post-it. So, before I do that, you guys know I need to circle all the things that I need to because I don't need my eyesight getting messed up. So, Lamington, I'm going to use the yellow. So morning Okay. So the Hebrew word is a bell, which is E B E L. So I'm going to write that out. E B E L, which originates from another Hebrew word, Hebrew word, which is a ball, which is A B A L. So A B A L, which means to mourn or to be well. The English definition. And that definition I'm getting ready to tell you I got from the um, Webster's Dictionary is the act of sorrowing a period of time.
starting with signs of grief. Are shown. So, sackcloth is a co coarse, loose cloth or sack used in mourning and for bagging. Lamenting is to mourn aloud, to wail, or to regret strongly in mourning. The Hebrew word is ibal, which originates from the Hebrew word abal, meaning to mourn or be well. The English definition is the act of sorrowing or a period of time during which signs of grief are shown. So those are the definitions that I have so far. And now we're going to read through an underline. So when Mordecai learned all that had been done, I'm going to underline that. Mordecai tore his clothes and put on sackcloth and ashes. So I'm going to underline tore his clothes and put on sackcloth and ashes and went out into the midst of the city and he cried out with a loud and bitter cry I'm going to underline he cried out with a loud and bitter cry I know I don't know how to um, make it auto lock that's the only problem that I'm having. So I need to figure out how Facebook Live works to where I can auto block it. Auto lock it, sorry. Yeah, I'm going to have to figure that out, Anne, because it's kind of hard. Like, I have to do the autofocus prior to turning on the live, but it still ends up blurring anyway. So I'm not 100% sure. But um, is this better right now, the view? And sorry, good morning, ladies. Yeah, and just let me know if this is a, a little better, and I don't know, I have to figure all that out. I'm going to try to work on that this weekend to figure out how the live works. Good morning, Vicky. Okay. I'll just try to keep my hands out as best as possible <laughs> so that it doesn't blur or keep it rather out of the way of the words. Yeah, I see now. Okay. I see what you're talking about. I just put my hand in the camera and it blurred. Um, I'll just go a little slower since it's only 17 verses. I'll slow down and keep my hand out of the camera as much as possible when I'm not writing. But, um, okay. Moving on, I'm going to continue reading. Um, verse 2. He went up to the entrance of the king's gate, for no one was allowed to enter the king's gate clothed in sackcloth. Verse 3. And in every province, wherever the king's command and his decree reach, reach there was great, sorry, there was great mourning among the Jews. So I'm going to underline there was a great mourning among the Jews okay Robin all right Latoya thanks Stacy so I'll just um I'll make sure that once I'm done writing whatever I need to write I'll move my hand out the camera so you guys can see it a little better um with fasting and weeping and lamenting and many of them lay in sackcloth and ashes. Um, I'm actually going to go back and underline verse 2, which I didn't have originally in my notes. But um, where it says he went up to the entrance of the king's gate. I'm going to underline that. And where do I want to put my notes? I guess on a sticky note, a smaller sticky note will do. So I'm going to use this, um, the Zebra Mount Liners. This is the cool collection. It comes with these colors here. So I'm just going to use this one, which I think is called Mild Smoky Blue or something like that, to underline that one. Boop. 
the green. Okay, so I'm going to write my notes on the post-it off the camera and then put it on the camera so it doesn't blur up for you guys. But, um, okay, so when Mordecai learned all that had been done, I'm going to write verse 1 for that. And that's just letting me know um, that Mordecai found out about the events that took place in chapter 3 with Haman's plan. Sorry, Haman's plan. I always say Haman, but it's Haman. So, um, referring to events Just writing out these notes before I show you guys so it doesn't blur out. But, um, okay. So, when Mordecai learned all that had been done, that refers to the events that Haman set in motion in chapter 3. When him and the king basically discuss um, decreeing that all the Jews should be destroyed. Mordecai tore his clothes and put on sackcloth and ashes. Um, this is him, basically him being Mordecai. This is Mordecai mourning the coming loss of him and his people. So, Mordecai... Mourning the loss of his people and self. And went out into the midst of the city and he, cry and he cried out with a loud and bitter cry. So the portion where it says he cried out with a loud and bitter cry. Um, basically, Mordecai was upset about the outcome from his own actions of integrity when he did not bow down or pay homage to Ham Haman. Sorry, when he didn't um, pay homage to Haman. So basically, he felt terrible, but he also didn't want to change his mind on paying homage to Haman to save himself or his people because he definitely could have just went to Haman and probably bowed down before him to save his people and himself but he chose not to so this cry was also a cry of um despair but also him just venting and being upset about the outcome due to his own actions so it's kind of like little situations where you can easily fix the problem but you don't want to break your own integrity and um kind of degrade yourself to fix the problem hopefully that makes sense but um that's basically how he felt and i do have a cross reference for that but i'm going to show you i'm going to give you guys the cross references once i show you guys the notes that i have so um how am i going to write this upset with outcome
Oh, I'm almost done, guys. Sorry about that. Um, he went up to the entrance of the King's Gate. This is still letting me know that Mordecai still has some type of important role for the simple fact that he can just stroll up to the King's Gate and not be um, reprimanded for that. So I'm just going to say that he's a man of influence. And then verse 3 where it says there was a great mourning among the Jews. All the Jews who heard and were aware of the degree began to do the same as Mordecai. They expressed their grief and horror publicly. So this was a public expression. Okay, so I'm going to put the notes on the screen now so you guys can see them. So, when Mordecai learned all that had been done, this is referring to the events that... Okay, this is referring to the events that Haman set in motion in chapter 3. Tore his, clo tore his clothes and put on sackcloth and ashes. Mordecai which is in verse 1 here, Mordecai is mourning the loss of his people and himself to come. He cried out with a loud and bitter cry. This was Mordecai being upset with the outcome due to his own actions of integrity. He could have fixed it, but he did not. This was a cry of despair and anger. And I do have a cross-reference with the Psalms 51, 17. So I'm going to flip to that quickly. So here it is. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart. Oh God, you will not despise. So we know for a fact that um, Mordecai definitely was remorseful for what he did. But at the same time, he didn't want to go back on um, the word of God to pay homage to Haman or Haman. Sorry, Haman. And um, yeah. Okay, verse 2. He went up to the entrance of the king's gate. This is basically Mordecai is a man of influence. In order for him to be so close to the king's gate and not have been reprimanded or killed or beaten or whatever the case may be, um, he had to be someone of high influence. So that's what I wrote. And then there was a great mourning among the Jews. Basically, this was a public expression of grief and horror about the king's decree. And this was something that all of the Jews in the Persian Empire did. So... That's all that I have for the first three verses. So hopefully that made sense. If not, just let me know. You guys know I like questions. <laughs> so I'm just going to stick it here. And all of these notes are definitely still um, going to be in the printable when I post it later on. So no worries if you can't catch it now. Let me just wait to put that back up. I don't know, wait. Forgot to add my other post-it. With the definition. Okay. So I'm going to read verses 4 through 11 first, then circle, and then underline. So reading it through. When Esther's young woman and her eunuchs came and told her the queen was deeply distressed, she sent garments to clothe Mordecai so that he might take off his sackcloth, but he would not accept them. Verse 5. Then Esther called for Hatak. I haven't even learned how to pronounce that name, so I probably should have. But um, called for Hatak, one of the king's eunuchs who had been appointed to attend her, and ordered him to go to Mordecai to learn what this was and why it was. Hathak went out to Mordecai in the open square of the city in front of the king's gate, and Mordecai told him all that had happened and the exact sum of money that Haman, Haman 
had promised to pay the, into the king's treasuries for the destruction of the Jews. Verse 8, Mordecai also gave him a copy of the written decree issued in Susa for their destruction, that he might show it to Esther and explain it to her and command her to go to the king and beg his favor and plead with him on behalf of her people. Verse 9, And Hathak went and told Esther what Mordecai had said. Then Esther spoke to Hathak and commanded him to go, go, to, go to Mordecai and say, Verse 11, all the king's servants and the people of the king's provinces know that if any man or woman goes to the king inside the inner court without being called, there is but one law to be put to death except the one to whom the king holds out the golden scepter so that he may live. But as for me, I have not been called to come into the king's into sorry, I have not been called to come into the king these thirty days. Don, I think that um he did because it said that he, you know, he basically cried out aloud in a bitter cry. He was probably bitter over the fact that um, you know, Haman was now punishing all of the people for his one mistake. But um the scripture that I was referring to last time, which I couldn't find, which was irritating me, was actually Psalms ninety five and six, which I'll quickly read that. Um, 95 and 6 of Psalm says, O oh, come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord, our maker, for he is our God, and we are the people of his pasture and the sheep of his land. Um, sorry, the sheep of his hand. So bowing down, which was paying homage um, for Mordecai, was more of reverencing, a, was more of a thing that he would do to reverence God. So he felt like bowing down to Mordecai would make, I mean, not Mordecai, bowing down to Haman would make him um, an idol in a sense. So I get where Mordecai was coming from with not wanting to do that. But now he feels the brunt of that because now all of his people are being punished for his one mistake. But he technically can't go back on it because then he feels like if he goes back on that, he'll be um, breaking some type of commitment or some type of loyalty to God. Hopefully that makes sense. But um, yeah, I think it was a, a little bit of his anger as well as the guilt um, and not being able to really do anything about it because either way someone would suffer. Either he would suffer for bowing down and making um, Haman his kind of god in a sense or Haman would still be upset for him not bowing down. So it's kind of a lose-lose situation for Mordecai in this kind of um, predicament. Alrighty. So I didn't have any words in this um, paragraph that I really wanted to define. Um, I probably would have circled his the Hathak's. I'm going to say Hathak. Um, I probably would circle that name just to figure out how to pronounce it and what it means. But other than that, um, I don't really have anything here that I wanted to define in this, in this paragraph here. So we're going to keep going. And we're going to underline. So um, it's going to get a little blurry. I apologize. It seems to get blurry when I put my hand in the camera, but I have to underline. So um, yeah, so I'm going to underline um, Esther's young woman and her eunuchs came and told her. So I'm underlining that. The queen was deeply distressed. I'm also underlining that. And that's in verse 4. She sent garments to clothe Mordecai so that he might take off his sackcloth, but he would not accept them. Going on to verse 5. Then Esther called for Hathak, one of the king's eunuch, who, has, who had been appointed to attend her, and ordered him to go on to Mordecai and to learn what this was and why it was. So I'm going to underline that. Ordered him to go to Mordecai to learn what this was and why it was. Hathak went out to Mordecai in the open square of the city in front of the king's gate, verse 7, and Mordecai told him all that had happened. I'm going to underline that Mordecai told him all that had happened. And the exact sum of money Haman had promised to pay the kings. So I'm going to underline this whole portion. Going on to verse 8, I'm underlining Mordecai also gave him a copy of the written decree.
issued in Susa for their destruction that he might show it to Esther and explain it to her and command her to go to the king to beg his favor and plead with him on behalf of her people. I'm going to underline this last portion that says command her to go to the king to beg his favor and plead with him on behalf of her people. Um, skipping verse 9 and verse 10, jumping straight to verse 11. For verse 11, I'm going to bracket the whole thing, but I'm also going to underline a specific line. So for all of verse 11, I'm just bracketing it because I have a note for the whole thing. But um, for the last line, I think it is, yes, where it says, but as for me, I have not been called to come to into the king these 30 days i'm also going to underline that i need a piece of paper quickly no i don't okay good dawn <laughs> um okay where do i want to write my notes i hope and you need lots of space. We're going to figure this out right now today. But, um, okay. So it's Hathak. Yolanda, is that how you pronounce it? I have no idea. You know what? That is the power of the internet. <laughs> Give me one quick second, you guys, because I'm going to figure this out right now. Blue Letter Bible. Esther chapter 4. Morning, Mommy. <laughs> um, okay. Here it is. And what verse is this? This is verse 5. And we're going to learn how to pronounce this name. Strong's H2047. Hethach. Hethach. Okay, so you don't really pronounce the K, but um, Hethach. Is how you say it so yep there we go figured it out hopefully I remember that I probably won't but you know we're gonna keep it going so um okay so going back to verse 4 the young woman and her eunuchs came and told her let me go back to my notes if I can find them quickly okay so, um, this line here where it says the young woman and her, Esther's young woman and her eunuchs came and told her, yes, and Blue Letter Bible is like a lifesaver when you need to learn how to pronounce some names and some words. <laughs> but, um, okay, like I was saying, that basically is letting me know that even though Esther is the queen of the Persian Empire, she's still isolated from the world, um, because she definitely doesn't know what her husband did, she doesn't know the decree that Haman, um, or Haman, I keep saying Haman, but it's Haman. She doesn't know about the decree that Haman made against her people. She's basically clueless about everything um, because she's isolated, though she is the queen. So I'm going to simply write that though she is a queen, she still lives in isolation. And it's going to go blurry, so I apologize ahead of time. So, though she is a queen, she still lives in isolation. Moving on to the line where it says the queen was deeply distressed. Um, she Basically, she didn't know what was going on. So, she didn't understand why Mordecai was making a spectacle of himself. So, clueless as to why.
And I'm going to connect these two. They're not the same, but I'm connecting them because it's basically telling me why she didn't understand. So um, Esther's young woman and her eunuchs came and told her, though she was queen, she lived in isolation. And the queen was deeply distressed. She was clueless as to why Mordecai was making a spectacle of himself. And the reason of that is because she lived in isolation so much so that her um, women and the eunuchs had to come and tell her what was going on with everything that took place. So let's go with the purple because I do like this purple color. It's so pretty. And pink. Going down to verse 5 where I underline the part where it says, Ordered him to go to Mordecai to learn what this was and why this was. Esther had a need to understand what was wrong with her cousin, so she sent someone who could go in her place to do so, because as a queen, she wasn't able to freely move around. So, um, I'm going to write over here, and you guys know it's going to get blurry, but I'll move my hand once I'm done. Um, Esther had a need. to understand Okay, so Esther had a need to understand Mordecai's actions, so she sent someone who could go to find out for her because we understand that she lived in isolation and she didn't understand what Mordecai's um, actions were for. So, we have that. And we're going to go with this blue color here. Sorry that I shook the camera, guys. <laughs> I need to find a better pen because I noticed that the pen ink is starting to seep through. You guys can see here, pen ink is starting to seep through. So I think I'm going to try out the Pigma Micron pens. Um, I'll probably just pick them up. I don't want to order them on Amazon because I've heard some things. Um, do any of you guys use archival ink pens like the Pigma Microns? Thinking about trying those out because I don't like how um, the pen ink is starting to seep through the pages. And I heard that it will continue to seep through throughout the years. So I don't know. What pens do you guys use? I do love my 0.7 millimeter pens. So what pens do you guys use? Um, okay, so moving on to verse 7 where it says Mordecai told him all that had happened. Mordecai basically divulged or all that um, Haman had planned to do by way of the king. So, And then where it says the exact sum of money that Haman had promised to pay into the king's treasures. Um, basically, Mordecai was aware of the money motive that made the king receptive to Haman's evil plan. 
this shows once again that Mordecai knows um, important people or he himself is an important person. And um, yeah, he's basically referring back to what Haman, not, yeah, what Haman was promising the king back in Esther 3.9. And if I can quickly flip to that, um, it says here, if it pleases the king, let it be decreed that they be destroyed and I will pay 10,000 talents of silver into the hands of those who have charge of the king's businesses that they might put it into the king's treasuries. So, I'm going to write... Okay, so verse 7, Mordecai told him all that had happened. Mordecai basically divulged Haman's plan by way of the king to um, the eunuch that Esther had commanded to go to Mordecai. And then also that he told him the exact sum of money that Haman promised <clears throat> to pay into the king's treasuries. Mordecai was aware of the money motive that made the king receptive to Haman's evil plan, which you can see back in Esther 3.9 where Haman talks about the 10,000 talents of silver that he was going to put into the king's treasuries in order that the king might basically allow the decree to destroy all the Jews in one day. Verse 8, Mordecai also gave him a copy of the written decree. Mordecai was prepared to ask his cousin for help. Um, he was prepared to show her everything. So where it says, commanded her to go to the king to beg his favor and plead with him on behalf of her people. Mordecai basically, um, okay, it, this can be seen in two ways where it says that he commanded her to go to the king to beg his um, favor and plead with him on behalf of her people. Some people can see it as Mordecai forgetting who his niece slash cousin was to him um, because she's not queen. So for him to command the queen is a little strange in that day and time. But on the flip side, it can also be seen as um, a test of faith, a sort of challenge for Esther to go before the king, knowing everything that took place within herself. Hopefully that makes sense. I'm going to write out my notes for you guys. But um, so verse 8. So the first portion, which I'll use orange for here, where it says Mordecai also gave him a copy of the written decree. That's basically Mordecai being prepared with physical evidence of um, what Haman had planned. Her mom, yeah, Haman had planned, sorry. Um, and then the second portion commanded her to go to the king to beg his favor and plead with him on behalf of her people. This was basically a test of faith. Um, 
This is Mordecai's challenge. To Esther. A test of faith. For her. Thanks, Latoya. I'm definitely going to check out those pins. No problem, Stacy. I um I have started uploading them onto YouTube. So um I still need to upload chapters 2 and now 3 and 4 to YouTube. But chapter 1 is already up. So I know that there's a problem with the um, Facebook videos with some people watching it. Because it tends to lag or shut down or whatever. So I'm definitely going to upload the videos um, before Saturday. They should all be up hopefully before Saturday. Chapter 1 is up already. I'm going to try to get Chapter 2 up as well, and um, 3 and 4 by Saturday. So it's no problem. But um, thanks, Latoya. I'm definitely going to check out those pins, because I find that this one is starting to really still bleed through the paper. Um, but yeah, command her to go to the king to beg his favor with him on behalf of her people. This is Mordecai's challenge to Esther, um, and it's also a te test of her faith. So I'm skipping 9 and 10 because I don't have anything for that. But for 11, I do have quite a lot for verse 11. So um, starting off with this portion where it says, But as for me, I have not been called to come into the king these 30 days. Um, she basically hasn't seen her husband in 30 days, a month. So hold on. I'm going to write my note first. Esther has not seen King. A lot of blue going on on this page, but that's okay. All right, so the last verse, um, the last line in verse 11 where it says, But as for me, I have not been called to come into the king these 30 days. Um, Esther has not seen her husband, the king, in a month, so this shows the lack of intimacy between the two of them. And my fiance is calling me, but I can't answer. <laughs> but um, it's basically showing the lack of intimacy between the two of them. And um, it may have made her feel a bit inadequate as a wife and as the queen. But um, basically after Hathok came back and told her what Mordecai had said about her going to the king to beg mercy or rather favor and plead with him on behalf of her people she immediately goes into giving an excuse um, and I'm basically gonna read what my note says it says this was Esther being reasonable but thinking carnally as the queen she knew the rules and felt that herself she could not break those rules she knew the difficulty and the consequences of her actions if she did go to the king she immediately allowed fear to grip her which is very true to how we as humans are without thinking of going to god first we let fear creep in and make us frightened so immediately upon getting this um command from her cousin she's like no i can't do it um i haven't seen my husband in 30 days if i go before him i could basically die like it's it's never been heard of and she doesn't have enough faith um or rather the courage to go about 
going to the king to get favor from him for her people. Um, so it show it's basically showing how we are as humans. Um, if someone tells us to do something and we haven't, I, I, let me think of an example. Um, okay, I'll use myself as, as an example. I was in school. Um, I haven't completed my last year of college. Um, I left school with a 3.57 GPA. Um, I did I did three years of college already, and I have one year left. But um, people are always telling me to you know go reapply. But when they tell me to reapply, my first thought isn't God is going to work it out. My first thought is I can't go reapply because financial aid is too much. I don't work and I have a son. That's the first thing that I think of. Um, and it's kind of the same thing with Esther. The first thing she thought of was I didn't see my husband in, in a month. Um, if I go to him, I'm going to die. It's kind of like that. But we as people need to really start putting God first and really thinking about him first and having that faith. Because um, those little things that happen in life are really a test of faith. And I've failed the test of faith plenty of times when it comes to me reapplying for college, even now. Um, I'm supposed to be applying for cosmetology school and astrology school, but there's still some bit of fear um, keeping me back from doing so because of the whole financial aid process. And um, I'm kind of, in a sense, like Esther at this point, where I'm just like, eh, if I do it, I might not get it. Or, you know, I might be, um, they might decline me or something like that. That's kind of like how it is. So I don't know if any of you have felt that way before where, um, how Esther is starting to feel. But, um, I know that I have in plenty of situations. But the main one that I know for a fact that I am like that is when it comes to me working. Um, like starting, um, my t-shirt line, it, it brings fear. Or going and applying for school brings me fear because of the whole, um, financial aid process but for verse 11 let me just write my note down because it's a lot um So the note that I'm writing for that is Esther's excuses um, that are reasonable. As queen, she knew the rules and knew the consequences of disobeying them. She immediately allowed fear to grip her. Without thinking about God, we let fear um, fear creep in. So that's my note for the whole of verse 11. Okay, and the last paragraph actually will be done by 12. Yes, Leona, I love that acronym. I actually want to put that on my wall somewhere. I love that acronym. Prefer. Well, um, Latoya, it would really depend. Um, 
I mean, I know some people who have panic attacks um, just because they go deep into their minds. And then I know some people have it um, because it's more of a medical concern. I, I could say that could be an example, just depending, if that makes sense. Um, I mean, for me, I probably would go into a panic attack because I've never been on a plane. So me, my immediate fear would be the plane crashing or... I don't know something happened I, my, my my mind would immediately go to like the worst thing possible just because I've never been on the plane um, instead of me immediately thinking that you know I know the God of God the King of Kings the Lord of Lords I know that he can keep this plane up I know that he can sustain the plane until we get to where we need to go um, hopefully that just made sense <laughs> I don't know I hope that just made sense but, I mean, it would depend on what the, I guess, in a sense, it would depend on what the panic attack is for. I don't really know, because I, I don't know. That That's a good one. Wow. I think it really would depend, though. I mean, because I, logically speaking, carnally, I'm thinking in a physical kind of sense, I would say panic attacks on a plane, that, that it's logical to me. It, it makes sense. I've never been on the plane. I probably would freak out. Like, I would totally freak out. But at the same time, if I'm looking at it spiritually, I shouldn't have to freak out because I know who God is. I know that he is the source of all. He's the creator of all. He's a provider. He's a comforter. He's a protector. Um, so I know for a fact that he can get this plane from destination A to destination B. But also, being a human, I'm going to freak out having never been on a plane and having been around for 9-11 and watching so many ridiculous TV shows. I would immediately freak out like I would totally freak out I think for me I would freak out and pray at the same time like that that would be me freaking out and praying together at the same time that that yep that would be me but um <laughs> it is 1101 wow we're probably gonna be done by 12 because we are on the last paragraph that is that is the first time you guys we would ever be done by 12 <laughs> fear can grip us to the point we don't move. Yes, yes, um, Don, I totally agree. That that definitely is me. Um, fear used to keep me in bondage, um, and it doesn't as much anymore. But there are certain things, like I have a desire to um, start a t-shirt line. I have a desire to work in a hair salon doing makeup. I have a desire to um, just do a lot um, entrepreneurial-wise. But I always go to like the what if thoughts like I want to start a t-shirt line. I've had people ask me about some of the shirts that I wear um, that want to buy the shirts. But there's something which I would assume is fear stopping me from doing that. And it's very bad because my friends um, at church, they're just like every Sunday they see me. They're like, OK, so when you're going to do these shirts? And I'm just like, I don't know. My fiance knows that I want to start a um a kind of body care line and he's constantly asking me when but I just I don't know and it's not that I don't know but there's just this like this what if factor and that what if factor I've learned is basically um, a part of fear it's a type of fear that holds me back and it's not good um, so it keeps me from moving in the direction that I should be going because there are so many ways I could be making money even though I'm not working an actual nine to five but my biggest fear is what if it fails and I mean, I know that failing is a part of life. Um, you're going to fail. You're going to learn from those failures so that you can move forward and do better things. But, you know, fear is a tricky one. <laughs> fear definitely is. But let's get into this last, chap um, last paragraph. Let me scroll back up to my definitions because I have the last one, the last few definitions here. But um, so reading it through, this is going to be verses 12 to 17. And it reads, and they told Mordecai what Esther had said. Then Mordecai told them to reply to Esther, do not, to, I'm sorry, do not think to yourself that in the king's palace you will escape any more than all the other Jews. For if you keep silent at this time, relief and deliverance will rise for the Jews from another place. But you and your father's house will perish. And who knows whether you have not come to the kingdom for such a time as this. Then Esther told them, to reply to Mordecai, go gather all the Jews to be found in Susa and hold a fast on my behalf and do not eat or drink for three days, night or day. I and my young women will also fast as you do. Then I will go to the king 
though it is though it is against the law and if i perish i perish verse 17 mordecai went away and did everything as esther had ordered him so i do have four words that i want to circle the first one being silent so silent i want to circle perish so i'm not going to circle the perish that's in um mm, yeah i'm just going to circle this one um perish i have fast where is it and the last one i have is ordered So you guys know the drill. I am going to circle those first. I'm taking the other um, zebra mount liners here. This is the warm pack. If I'm not mistaken, these are the colors in it. I'm going to use these three colors. I feel like I have enough blue as it is. <laughs> so we're going to stick with these three colors. I'm going to use this one, which I think is called Mild Magenta. And then this Vermilion color, Parish. And where's my post-it notes? Oh, okay. I'm going to write silent on this paper. And silent is making no utterance, free from sound or noise, not speaking or making a sound. So... Free from sound or noise is what I'm going to write. Free from sound or noise. I'm going to write perish. And the Hebrew word for perish is abad. A-B-A-D. Hebrew word is abad, meaning to die. Or to become destroyed or ruined. To become destroyed or ruined. For fast, I'm gonna um the Hebrew word is soon. So Hebrew word soon, which means meaning to Abstain from food for a period of time. And then the last one is ordered.
Okay. So, oopsie. Silence, I put free from sound or noise. Parish, I wrote the Hebrew word abad, which is A-B-A-D, meaning to die or to become destroyed or ruined. For fast, it's Hebrew word sum, meaning to abstain from food for a period of time. And then ordered, which is here, is to give a command to or be given a command. So those are the words that I wanted to define. And going back down to my notes. Okay. So I don't have anything for verse 12. So I'm skipping straight to verse 13. Where it says, do not think to yourself that in the king's palace you will escape any more than all the other Jews. For if you keep silent at this time, relief and deliverance will come from another place. I'm going to underline that. Then I'm underlining you and your father's house will perish. And then I'm also underlining the last part where it says, and who knows whether you have not come to the kingdom for such a time as this. Going ahead to verse 16, where it says, Go and gather all the Jews to be found in Susa. And hold a fast on my behalf. Um, skipping down to where it says, I and my young woman will also fast as you do. I'm underlining that. And then I'm underlining the last line. Then I will go to the king, though it is against the law. And if I perish, I perish. And then I'm underlining the last verse. Okay. Hi, Kim. Yeah, Latoya. Um, I think the rest of the chapters are very short. Um, yeah. They're all less than 25 verses. Well, I think the longest chapter is 9 because chapter 9 has 32 verses, but the rest of them are very short, which I can appreciate. <laughs> I appreciate short chapters sometimes. But, um, okay, so verse 12, no, verse 13 is what I'm going to write. I'm actually going to grab a different post-it as well. Just in case. Okay, so verse 13 where I underline, do not think to yourself that in the king's palace you will escape any more than all the other Jews. Um, where'd it go? My note that I wrote um, basically said that Mordecai had to have known um, what happened to Vashti. I think everyone pretty much probably found out what happened to her. So there's no telling what would have happened to Esther once the king found out that she herself was a Jew. It was also a reminder that she could not stay hidden from the decree any more than another Jew could. So um, I'm going to write reminder that Esther could not hide her true identity I'm gonna just leave it at that she couldn't hide her true identity I'm sorry, just putting these um, markers, the highlighters back in the pack. But, okay. Um, moving on to 14. For if you keep silent at this time, relief and deliverance will rise for the Jews from another place. So 
Sorry, you guys. I'm just putting all of my tubes away so it's not all over the table. Um, I want to use purple for this. So the note that I wrote was keeping quiet does not mean the assignment won't get done. It simply means that you disobey God and he will find another to replace you with the assignment he designed specifically for you. This also shows Mordecai's trust in the faithfulness of God, not in his own cousin, which is a reminder for us to trust alone in God. Man cannot save us like, like God can. God will not allow sorry god will not let us down even if individuals let him down um so this first portion of verse 14 has a lot of weight to it um and again i will have all the whole complete okay sorry i will have all of these notes that i'm talking about written in the printable for you guys to print out but um i'm just writing the shorthand versions on the post-it notes but um Again, he said, for if you keep silent at this time, belief and deliverance will rise for the Jews from another place. His promise is rooted in um, in God, which is the promise that God said back in Jeremiah 29, 10 through 14, which I'll quickly read. Jeremiah 29, 10 through 14. Sorry. So 29, 10 through 14, it says, For thus says the Lord, when the 70 years are completed for Babylon, I will visit you and I will fulfill to you my promise and bring you back to this place. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans for welfare and not for evil, to give you a future and a hope. Then you will call upon me and come and, and, come and pray to me, and I will hear you. You will seek me and find me you, when you seek me with all your heart. Verse 14, I will be found by you, declares the Lord, and I will restore your fortunes and gather you from the nations and all the places where I have driven you, declares the Lord, and I will bring you back to the place from which I sent you into exile. So um, this was a promise that God made to the people of Israel um, that after their 70 years of being exiled, he would bring them all back to the place where they basically were exiled from. And um, this is Mordecai just being rooted in that promise saying that you know even if you yourself don't deliver your people someone else will deliver us instead of you um so how am i gonna write this huh i'm gonna write see jeremiah 29 10 through 14 is the first part that i want to write um there's just so much in this so i don't know how i'm gonna write this um I'm going to show the Mordecai's, I didn't have to write that, write that, whatever, I'm going to leave it like that. No, I'm not, because it's irritating me. So, shows Mordecai's, trust and faithfulness of God. not man um proves that keeping silence Okay, so, yeah, Don, basically, that's what I was basically saying, <laughs> that God will fulfill his promise. But, um, again, for verse 14, where it says, For if you keep silent at this time, relief and deliverance will rise for the Jews from another place. 
Basically, what I said was keeping quiet does not mean the assignment won't get done. It simply means that you disobey God and he will find another to replace you with the assignment he designed specifically for you. This also shows Mordecai's trust in the faithfulness of God and not in his own cousin, which is a great reminder to us to trust in God alone. Man cannot save us like God can. God will not let us down even if individuals let him down. Um, and the note that I wrote here was basically to see Jeremiah 29, 10 through 14. And then I wrote that it shows Mordecai's trust in faithfulness of God, not man. And it proves that keeping silent does not mean the assignment won't get done. Someone else will do it. So that's just the first portion of um, verse 14. <laughs> going on to the second portion. I'm going to use lime green for that. You and your father's house will perish. I'm actually going to go in real quick and underline now so that I don't have to worry about this as we finish up. Okay, I just had to do this because it was starting to irritate my eyes just looking at it. But, um, okay. So, you and your father's house will perish, which is still in verse 14. This is um, Mordecai reminding Esther that though the fate of God's people rested in his hand and not hers, it reminds her that her own fate depended on her own faithfulness to God. So... So he starts off with saying, if you keep silent at this time, so basically if you do not do the assignment that God has given you, that God will give the um, assignment to someone else. And that if she does keep silent, then her and her family and basic, not her family, but basically her in the name of her father's house will perish, meaning that her fate is dependent solely on her obedience and her faithfulness to God. Hopefully that just made sense. Yes, Leona, definitely. This definitely was an ego check. I think the whole last portion of um, chapter four was definitely an ego check for her. Um, and more so just a true test of her faith in God. Um, because even though they don't mention God, we know that them being Jews, that they're heavily um, loyal to God. They love God. We we understand this just from understanding the Jews. So um, despite God's name never being mentioned, we can basically um, kind of see it within if you read between the lines. So yeah, I definitely agree that it definitely was an ego check for her. Um, yeah, good questions. That's how basically I felt when I first studied Esther. Um, but, uh, Esther's a powerhouse is all I'm going to say. <laughs> She's definitely a powerhouse. Um, with, um, Latoya, she definitely is. Uh, see, I didn't forget where I was. Oh, okay. You and your father's house will, um, perish. So basically that was another reminder for her that, um, not only in the first portion, if she doesn't do the assignment that God gave her, he'll pass that assignment to someone else. But 
now her fate is now dependent on her faithfulness to God. She can live if she listens to God or she can die if she refuses to listen to God. And I think that was God using Mordecai to snap her out of her fear. Um, in a sense, that's at least how I'm seeing it because I don't think Mordecai knew that she was going to die. Um, I feel like that was God using him, speaking through him to speak to Esther directly, um, in a sense. And then moving on to the last portion of verse 14, because verse 14 just has so much information in it. Um, what is this? 14. Okay. It says, and who knows whether you have not come to the kingdom for such a time as this. So Esther was a Jew chosen to be the queen of the Persian Empire where she kept her identity secret. She found favor with God and man, and she was also loved by the king. Her becoming, um, not even her becoming, her meeting the king was her divine appointment. There was a specific reason to her meeting the king. There was a specific reason for her becoming the queen, and there was also a specific reason for her to keep her identity hidden for this exact point in time, and that hurt. Ow. <laughs> But, um, yeah, Mordecai knew of God's plan for her um, in the small scheme of things. Because I don't even think Mordecai himself understood the grand scheme of things. None of us really fully understand the grand scheme of things. We really only know a small portion of the plans that he has for us. So um, this is basically a reminder to us that God promotes us or puts us in a place for a reason. We need the courage and wisdom to see that reason and walk in it. I know that was a lot. Verse 14 is definitely jam-packed with a lot of goodness, um, which is why I really, really love the book of Esther. Esther and Esther and Ruth are just phenomenal. I'm going to just leave it at that. <laughs> but, okay, for this last part where it says, who knows whether you have not come to the kingdom for such a time as this. How do I, well, I want to shorthand write this. Um, this was her... divine appointment that promotes us or puts us in a place for a reason We need the courage and wisdom to see that reason and walk in it. Yes, Latoya, good things definitely do come, um, definitely do come. I think chapters, uh, five and on are really, really good and really go into depth about, um, the way that Esther went about helping her people. So we skipped verse 15 and going to 16 where it says, go gather all the Jews to be found in Susa and hold a fast on my behalf. Now. This is Esther knowing that she couldn't do this alone. This is her understanding that, I mean, you know, God places burden on her, but she can't handle it alone. And um, that's a reminder for me personally, because I know that I try to do everything on my own, especially when it comes to my son. Like, I don't work. Um, I haven't worked in God knows how long. I do um, do makeup here and there on a the side. I do side jobs and stuff like that. But um, a constant paycheck is something that I don't have. And I tend to rely solely on myself. I don't like to ask my fiance for anything. I don't like to ask my mother for help. I don't like asking anybody for help. 
But um, Esther here understands that she has this huge burden. And though it is her assignment, she understands that she can't do it alone. She understands that she needs support. So um, she knew that she couldn't do it alone. And she didn't allow herself to carry that burden alone. She sought support from her people even though she was afraid. Some things must, and also this tells us that um, some things can't be done. In a physical sense, um, this is a reminder that some things require fasting and praying to deal with. So I'm going to write C Matthew 17 and 20, because that's a cross reference I'm going to read in a second. But um, this is a two part uh, note that I have. So go gather all the Jews to be found in Susa and hold the fast on my behalf. Um, she sought help. Not help. She sought support even though she was afraid. Some things must be dealt with okay so verse 16 reads go gather all the Jews to be found in Susa and hold a fast on my behalf for that I wrote see Matthew seventeen twenty. she sought support even though she was afraid and some things must be dealt through fasting must be dealt with through fasting and praying. So um Matthew seventeen twenty. And I still need to read Matthew and Mark. Those are the only two gospels I have left. But seventeen and twenty. Um he said uh here I don't know if you guys can see it. He said to them, Because of your little faith, for I truly is this even the one? <laughs> um I have 17 and 20 written down, but I don't think this is the one, but um, I'm going to read it anyway. He said to them, because of your little faith, for I truly say to you, if you have little faith, if you have faith like a grain of mustard seed, you will say to this mountain, move from here to there and it will move and nothing will be impossible for you. I think it's because of the translation that I am not understanding it. But yeah, I, Matthew 17 and 10. Ma sorry, Matthew 17 and um, 20, but you can actually read all of uh, Matthew 17, verse 14 to 21, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, Matthew 14 to 21, which is about Jesus healing the boy with a demon in him. Um, Because if I'm not mistaken, this is the time where the disciples tried to do it themselves and they couldn't because they had little faith um, and really didn't know how to pray. But, um, yeah, that's it for 16, at least that first portion of 16. Moving on to the second line of 16. It says, I and my young woman will also fast as you do. She knew she needed to be, um, she knew this needed to be a united force with her people to get God's true direction. Um, so, she knew I have a cross reference for that, and it's Psalms thirty two eight. 32 and 8, if I can get to it, yes, 32 and 8, I will instruct you and teach you in the ways you should go, I will counsel you with my eye upon you, and um, basically, if you guys don't know, fasting and praying are two things that go together, when you fast, you pray, um, you necessarily don't have to, how can I say this? 
with fasting you're supposed to pray but with prayer you don't technically have to fast hopefully that makes sense but um let me write this real quick see psalms 32 and 8 i think there was one more line in verse 16 yeah and i broke that okay But, um, yeah, so when you fast, you're technically also praying. So she understood that they needed to do this as a united force as a whole in order for them all to get closer to God, as well as for her to have a better understanding of what God wanted her to do at this point in time to help her save her people. Um, let me put the comments back. Thank you, Don. <laughs> um, okay. Last part of 16, it says, then I will go to the king, though it is against the law. And if I perish, I perish. So this is Esther now having confidence in God before the king. She now carries a bold attitude and she's more determined to be obedient no matter the cost. So um, I have cross references for that, but I'm going to write this note first. So Esther is now confident in God. Carries a bold attitude. And determined. To be obedient. No matter the cost. The cross references I have are Matthews. 10 and 28 right 10 28 yes and then philippians 1 and 21 yes leona um there are okay so fasting at back in this time um during this era when the bible was written they only fasted from like food is my understanding but um nowadays in modern times um, that we live in a lot of people fast from very different things you can there are some people who still fast from food but um you can also fast from TV you can fast from the books that you read I know that I fasted from watching TV before I fasted from the type of books that I read because um, I like to read all genres of books um, including as some people categorize it as the erotic genre i like to read those kind of books i like paranormal no novels um i like contemporary romances i like all types of books but um i noticed that when i read certain type of books they tend to i don't want to say spark something in me but they tend to um make me have desires that don't align with the word of god if that makes sense um so like if i read an erotic novel it will uh, what was the word that I can use? <laughs> um, it will make my flesh desire a man, if that makes sense. Um, if I read a paranormal novel about somebody having suicide or, I don't know, some type of demonic thing, it will make me start to think a certain way. Um, so there are times where I have to allow myself to stop reading those things. And um, I used to do it a lot. Now I don't even have to fast as much because... I can't even stomach reading certain books now. Like, literally, I cannot read it. The words tend to irritate me. Um, I used to fast from music. I would fast. Like, when my church did their um, fast when I was younger, I didn't really fast from food as a kid because I was a kid, but I would fast from, like, music and stuff. And um, I kept doing that. And even recently, my church, we did a fast on um, the beginning of the year, and I fasted from music. And I've found that from this last fast that I did, I can no longer listen to hip-hop and R&B like I used to. I literally will listen to hip-hop and R&B maybe one hour a day, and that's just in different increments. Like, I might listen to 30 minutes in the morning. In the afternoon, I might listen to 15 minutes of it because after a certain time, my ears start to hurt. They start to ring, and um, 
I don't know. Um, I know some people who completely go cold turkey on a lot of things, but I think fasting is a great way to put your flesh under, um, is the word subjection? I don't know. What, what is the word? To submit your flesh to God, to submit your flesh to the word and allow your spiritual man, your inner man, your spirit man, um, become stronger. So, um, it definitely is putting God above your own fleshly needs. Um, and you can do that, be it with food, with music, with reading, um, with hanging out with certain, you can fast from people too, if you need to. I've never had the need to fast from people, but, um, I'm pretty sure if you had certain people in your life that are not as spiritual as you or helpful as you, um, not helpful, but, um, that are not going to push you in the right direction spiritually, then you could fast from them, be it a day, uh, not a day, I'm not going to say a day. Be it a week, um, three days, like Esther was doing here. I mean, there are people who do the Danu fast, which I heard is a very tough fast. I think my mom has done it before. But, um, you know, there's different ways to fast. But, yeah, back in this time and era, they just fasted from food. But, um, <laughs> yes, and the inner man. Yeah, Latoya, um, yeah, I, I thank God I've never had to really fast from people. Um, I don't know what that's like. Um... But I definitely have fasted from f certain types of foods. I've fasted from watching TV. I've fasted from hip hop and r and B. I've fasted from um, reading types of certain types of books, like um. And I think that's some. That's probably a reason why now um I can't really read the type of books that I used to read. I used to um do book reviews for different um companies like Thomas Nelson, not Thomas Nelson, um Harper Collins. And stuff like that that produce like the young adults fictions and stuff. I used to read those type of books, but now I can no longer stomach reading them. Um, like I can read them here and there, but I can't read them like I used to. So, um, yeah. Fasting, I think, is something that um, is an individual type of experience. Yeah. I'm just looking at you guys' uh, comments. <laughs> I'm sorry, Lorraine. Right now, to what? I don't know if you posted a comment prior to that one. I'm trying to find it, but I can't. So if you could just retype what you were saying, Lorraine. But, um, yeah, I'm going to finish up. Then we can have a discussion, <laughs> you guys. But, um, yeah, so... Or that last line, then I will go to the king, though it is against the law. And if I perish, I perish. I have Matthews ten twenty eight. So let's flip to that. Matthews ten twenty eight. Um, it says, and do not fear those who kill the body but cannot kill the soul. Rather, fear him who can destroy both soul and body in hell. Which is, wow, a good one. Um, <laughs> and then Philippians 1 and 21. Um, Philippians 1 and 21. These pages are still stuck together. For to me to live is Christ and to die is gain that's a good one for to me to live is Christ and to die is gain so those are the references that I have for the last portion of that and um, the last verse which is verse 17 which says Mordecai went away and did everything as Esther had ordered him um, what did I write Oh, basically, the um, roles of Mordecai and Esther are now reversed because if you guys remember, and I think that was chapter 2 and 3, we hear that Mordecai basically commanded Esther to no longer, um, not no longer, he commanded Esther to keep her identity hidden. And now we have her giving him a command to um, follow, and he does it without care for age or ranking. He does it with full loyalty. So this just shows the... Um, the respect, adoration, and love that they have for each other as family members. So, um,
I wrote that it shows the respect and love for one another despite age or ranking. Because um, even nowadays when you have a younger person telling an older person to do something, they immediately get upset or tell them to respect their elders. And um, if you have an uh, older person telling a younger person something, you know, younger kids have smart mouths nowadays. So this just really shows the um, the bond that they have as family members as well as within their court rankings. They don't look to the court rankings. They do things because um, it's love between them. So that's pretty much it for Esther 4. Um, it's really all about Mordecai finding out what happened with um, Haman and how Haman is now seeking to kill all the Jews and Mordecai now wants Esther to seek out favor and plead with the king her husband who mind you who she hasn't seen in a month um to go before him and save her people but Esther immediately begins to fear she doesn't have the courage to do so but she gets this powerful re reminder from her cousin that it's not about her and that if she keeps silent she can die or she can save her people and um you know, she relies on her people to support her, and she decides that she will obey God's command. Um, so hopefully that just made sense. <laughs> but um, yeah, I like chapter 4 of Esther a lot. I really do. Um, so I'm going to quickly look through you guys' comments real quick. Yeah, Leona, definitely. Like, I used to watch what I call, I call it Ratchet Monday, and that's when they do, like, the love and hip-hop shows. Um, I used to watch those faithfully with my mother. Um, literally just sit there and watch it and laugh at it, um, just because I think they're ridiculous. But, um, I don't know. I can no longer stomach it. Like, I'll watch clips here and there of it on Instagram, but to actually sit down and watch it for, an whole, for a whole hour, it irritates my soul. Like, it irritates me to a T. I don't know what it is. I don't know if it's just God elevating me in a different level, but, um, to a different level, but just certain things just irritate the mess out of me now. Well, Leona, in a sense, that's probably, it was probably God telling you to not, um, watch it. But it also would be considered a fast. I mean, some people would say it's a fast. Um, for me, I definitely, it was, it was part of a fast, and then, um, I did start hearing the voice of God telling me to stop watching and stop listening to certain things, um, because it doesn't edify my spirit at all, um, and there is a huge difference, you guys, like, I like Chris Brown a lot, I'm a huge Chris Brown fan, I have been since he came out almost a decade ago, and, um, you know, I can't listen to his songs because they... I'm going to say awaken <laughs> my flesh to feel in a certain way. And um, that is very contradictory to the word of God. Back then, I would listen to it without a care. But me now understanding um, the word of God a lot better, certain songs will awaken my flesh to feeling a certain way or awaken my mind to thinking a certain way. And um, it doesn't it doesn't edify my spirit. So I just refuse to listen to certain songs. Like I'll, I can listen to them for a few minutes, but after that... It's just like, all right, it's time to change it because my ears will literally ring. And I don't know if that's my spirit telling me to stop or if that's God telling me to stop. But when I feel that ringing in my ear, it, it's time to like stop in my eyes when I'm watching certain shows. Um, after some time, my eyes get blurry, like just will completely get blurry. Um, I get headaches after I have certain conversations with people if it's not edifying my spirit. Like it, it's insane. The the little hints and um, things that I get from my spirit as well as from God when I do things that are not edifying to my spirit or according to his word. It's insane. Like, <laughs> I think it's so insane. Yeah, I call it Ratchet Monday always. And I just feel like it's ratchet. Um, a lot of the people on the shows, they're probably good people, but the things that they do on these shows are not influential if that makes sense um it I, I i don't i will never understand like i used to watch it to laugh at it but now i don't even feel like laughing at it i feel like praying for them and i don't know like i said god is moving me to a whole nother level <laughs> but yeah Yo, 
You're welcome, Kimberly. Yes, um, I will say, Kimberly, I am a fan of writing in the Bible. Um, it can be nerve-wracking, like completely nerve-wracking, I understand. Um, but I think that's why I like journaling Bibles a lot because they give you that open space on the sides. Um, eh, if I can move this over like this to um, write your notes. It took me a while to actually write in my regular Bibles um, because, I don't know, I just always felt like writing in the Bible was kind of like defiling the Word of God. But um, once I got a journaling Bible, it changed my life, like completely changed my life. But um, yes, yeah, sticky notes. I'm a fan of sticky notes. I love sticky notes. Use all the sticky notes in the world. Buy you some cute journals and write your notes in them. And um, yeah, I'll definitely be uploading these onto YouTube. So no worries about that. You can always rewatch them down the line. Um, but thank you so much for watching the videos though, Kimberly. <laughs> You're welcome, Dawn. Yes, I'm excited. Chapter 5. Um, chapter 5 was only 14, 14 verses. Wow. These are some really short chapters. Yeah, it's only 14 verses for chapter 5. Oh, yes. The, see, the thing with that, Latoya, is it's not the people themselves that give me headaches, but it's the conversations they like to have. Because even when I have um, conversations with um, certain Christians, the things that they spew out of their mouths is just like, are you serious? Like, I don't understand why you're talking like that. And I'm not going to say I'm the perfect Christian because I'm not. There are some days that I curse. There are some days that I listen to hip hop. There are some days that you will find me in my room dancing like I shouldn't be dancing. But it happens. Um, We're all human. But I just feel like if there is, um, when it comes to certain people, like I'm not going to say that I'm perfect because I know when I was younger, I used to laugh at um homeless people. And I'm not saying it in a sense that I was like laughing that they were homeless. But it was just something in me that just did it because I guess the people around me did it. Um, but of course, me being older now, I no longer laugh at that. I I literally will stand there and pray for them. I will pray in my mind for these people, pray out loud for these people. But when I see you being a 40-something-year-old grown woman and you're talking to me about a homeless person in a way that you shouldn't be talking about, it irritates my ears. Um, and it's not that they themselves are a terrible person. It's not that. It's just that some people are not mature yet to not laugh ab about certain things. I hope that makes sense. Um, yes, Leona. Oh, my God. YouTube is definitely one that I have gone to and removed. Okay, I'm going to get to that in a second, Leona. But, um, yeah. Um, but, again, it's not to say that they're not perfect Christians because, like I said, when I was younger, I would laugh at certain things that now that when I look at it, I was wrong for laughing at. But, um, you know, it's just certain certain people, it's not them themselves. It's just the conversations they choose to have irritate me. But, um, yes, back to Leona. Yes, um, YouTube, I have literally been spending this past week unsubscribing from a lot of YouTube channels. Like, so many channels I have unsubscribed from and it's not that um I don't like these people it's just that they're not edifying my spirit I don't want to follow anyone that doesn't edify my spirit I am still going on my YouTube and I mind you I have multiple YouTube channels only because I do multiple things on YouTube um even to the point where I don't I haven't uploaded a beauty tutorial on my makeup channel and forever I'm going to say over three months, I haven't uploaded and people will reach out to me. And it's not that I don't want to because I love doing makeup. Makeup is what I do. I work at a hair salon doing makeup. I do bridal makeup. I do prom makeup. I love it. But I don't feel like it's edifying to my spirit to do it right now or to others. Um, and I'm just waiting on God to tell me when to get back into it because there are days when I'm just like, yeah, I want to do makeup. But then it's just like, is it really going to be helpful? Um, I have a vlog channel. I haven't vlogged in almost, uh, I don't even know how many months, a while. I haven't vlogged in a while. And it's the same thing with that. I don't feel like it's edifying. Um, but with this Facebook group and my new YouTube channel, I can make videos all day long because I, I know for a fact that I'm edifying somebody and edifying myself. Um, so yeah, YouTube is definitely one of those things where I have just been removing myself from um, a few people's pages, unsubscribing. Because um, it's just, it's so much, it's so much. And um, YouTube has now become a place of drama, 
which I don't like. A lot of YouTube couples are breaking up, which is ridiculous to me. Like, I, when it comes to YouTube, I just, I don't know. I've just really been unsubscribed. And I'm actually going to do a video on, um... On, on my YouTube channel with some of my favorite Instagrammers as well as some of my favorite YouTubers because I want to help other people find other YouTubers that edify their souls um, and their spirits. So, yeah. Kimberly, Revelation. Ugh. We're definitely going to study Revelation, um, but I think the next the, the, the next study we're going to do in jo um, June is going to be John. Um, just because I love John. And John is one that I think everyone should really get into and study a lot. Revelation definitely will be coming. Um, I'm not sure when. It definitely will be before the end of 2018. Though, because I know a lot of us want to read Revelation. I have yet to read it myself. Um, so I definitely do want to study Revelation as a group. I'm not sure when. Um, I'm probably going to get a calendar together by, um, before summer with all these studies that we're going to do probably into 2019. Um, but Revelations will be coming. I'm just not sure when because it is such a very um, in-depth book of the Bible. It's the final book of the Bible. It's about the end times. It's, it's a very key book of the Bible. So um, we're definitely going to study it. I just don't know when. And yes, um, Latoya, we were definitely immature in our younger days, but, you know, growing up now, everybody matures differently. And especially um, if you're maturing in God or if you're maturing in the world or if you're still on the fence between both, it can be difficult. Um, I'm not going to lie. I myself used to be on the fence, um, not with my faith, but just with certain things. Um, I would abide by certain things in the Bible and not abide by certain things in the Bible. And one thing that I, I suffer with um, and, and I'm trying to break free from is sexual sin. Um, that's one of the things where, um, you know, the Bible is very direct about sex, but it is what it is. I mean, we as humans, our flesh desires sex, which is why I stopped watching certain shows and reading certain books. Um, I've even stopped myself from staying at my fiance's house. Um, just so that I can keep that boundary for myself, um, just because it is something that I struggle with and I'm working on getting better at it. And I know not a lot of people like to talk about sexual sin, but I'm pretty much an open book. Um, you know, I'm trying to keep Daughter of Increase as authentic as I can. Um, and I have no problem discussing it. I mean, I know a lot of people thank me for discussing it because I know some Christians don't. But um, sex is in the Bible. Sex, God created it as a good thing. It's not a bad thing. But out of the context of a covenant marriage, it is a bad thing. And I suffer with it. That's just what it is. I don't feel ashamed by that. I used to feel ashamed, but I don't anymore. Because there's nothing to be ashamed for. Um, a lot of people suffer from it, but some people don't mention it. So it is what it is. Um, but now that I've matured, not of the world no longer, but in the word of God, I now understand that um, the things that I was doing when I was on the fence with the sexual sin um, were wrong. So I'm working better at it to get closer to God and um, to keep myself from partaking in that until I am married. Yeah, I definitely try to um, keep myself as an open book though because I know... When I was growing up, I used to look for YouTubers and um, other people on, like, social media that were like that. But not many people were. Um, or if they were, they really weren't authentic about it. And, um, you know, I just feel like we need a lot more people who will be authentic, real, and open about their lives. No one is perfect. No one is going to always have everything 100% correct. And, um, yeah, Don, see, like, we all struggle with it, but not a lot of people talk about it and we're taught to keep that to ourselves but that's really not the case we shouldn't the bible tells us um that we are to go to our elders and other people to seek support i mean look at esther she knew she was going to die but she went to people to support her to fast and pray with her so that she could endure the burden that god placed on her to do so i mean i don't know maybe that's just me and myself um having grown up the way i have but, yeah, I'm trying to figure out how this goes. Okay, this one goes here. 
<laughs> and that one here, lots of notes today. And this one goes here. So I think those are all the notes. Those three there. And then these two here. So I'm going to stick this one back. And if I can get this back in spot where it belongs. I will say, though I don't watch as much Ratchet TV, what I have been watching, which I think is a shocker, is a lot of anime. And um, if you guys don't know what anime is, anime is basically Japanese cartoons. And I mean, if you know what Dragon Ball Z or Digimon or Pokemon is, that's basically what anime is. And as a kid, I used to hate anime because I, I didn't have a choice but to basically watch it when I was at my grandmother's house. But um, now as an adult, I can appreciate anime for the simple fact that when I watch anime, it may sound strange what I'm about to say, but when I watch anime, it really opens my eyes um, to understanding the Bible a lot more. Because we, um, if you guys don't know, Japanese cultures um, or the Asian culture in general, they have a lot of demon stories. Um, they have different gods. I don't really look to their gods. But when I watch their animes about some of the demons and stuff, I don't know, for some reason it just opens my eyes to the work of the enemy a lot. Um, and my mother used to think I was crazy. <laughs> she used to think I was crazy. But, like, when I tell her, like, certain things, certain anime shows will really help me understand the word of God more. And it sounds insane, but it does. And um, I watch anime a lot with my sis here in the house. And... I mean, we can watch an anime, and it could be about one thing, but we somehow relate it back to the Word of God, and it helps us understand it more. I know that might sound crazy to some of you, but, um, yeah. Yes, Lorraine. Anime is actually pretty interesting, um, yeah. <laughs> Let's tell you if they catch up on 3 and 4. That's no problem. Definitely don't rush through these, guys. Um, I definitely want you guys to take your time with them, um, because I want you to get as much as you can from it, whatever I'm telling you. I don't want to say telling you. I don't want to say teaching you. I guess showing you guys. Um, whatever I'm showing you guys, I definitely want you to be able to get on your own as well. Um, a different understanding. And Yeah, Leona, I hate when people do try to make um, celibacy sound so easy because it's not easy. It's, it's definitely a struggle. I failed at it plenty of times. It's a struggle. And, um, you know, I've had my moments when I've gone six months seven months almost a year but then I fall back in and um you know there's a lot of outside forces working against you there's music there's tv there's books especially for me books books was a major thing because I like my romance books I like my erotic novels I like those kind of things but those things do not edify my spirit they edify my flesh and then my flesh tends to desire something and then I tend to fall into that trap um, which sucks and um, I'm trying to keep myself from sexual sin I'm trying so hard to keep myself from sexual sin um, and it, it's it's a struggle it definitely is um, especially when you're engaged and you've been with your significant other for years I've been with my fiance now for six years we do have a son together well we're in our six years so five years but we're in the sixth year we have our son together and um, it, it's hard for me it really is but um, like I said, there are some boundaries that I keep. I have decided to no longer stay the night at his house. I can't. Um, and it's not that I feel that we're going to do anything. It's just to prevent me from even getting in that frame of mindset. Um, I'd rather just be in my house. We can go hang out, bring me home. That's just how I see it. And um, especially because I'm at that point where I feel like if we're going to continue down this route and we've been together for five plus years, we might as well be married. But I also don't want to rush the marriage process because we still have things to work out within ourselves. Um, me specifically, I have things to work out. So it's a struggle. I don't like when people, I, I hate when people talk about celibacy, how it's great. Um, it's not. It, it's, it's hard. It's very, very hard to do. Um, there's a young lady that I watch on YouTube. Um, her name is Morgan Tracy J. And her YouTube channel started off of her celibacy journey. And um, she's been celibate for a while. She makes videos about it. She talks about it. I'll um, post up her channel link on the in the group because I really like watching her videos. She's a young lady that really uh, really edifies my um, spirit. I love watching her. But um, yeah, 
thanks sis <laughs> and yes revelations is we're definitely going to be doing that the broadcast stopped huh really i don't know why i didn't stop it But, um, yeah, I think I'm just going to end it here, ladies. Um, it is 12.05. We actually ended before 12 o'clock, which is a shocker. <laughs> but, um, yeah, I'm going to upload the notes for you guys within the next two hours. Yeah, within the next two hours, they should. They might actually be up within the next 10 to 20 minutes. Um, I'm just going to edit a few things on there. I'm going to also link up the um, young ladies video channel that I was talking about just now and um, that's pretty much it so we'll be diving into chapter 5 next week it's only 14 verses so um, definitely read those 14 verses take your notes um, write your questions down or whatever the case may be and yeah I'll see you guys in the next video or the next live session and thanks for watching bye <laughs>